Father, we praise you for this day and for this opportunity to come and worship your holy name. You are worthy, worthy of our very best, worthy of our every breath, worthy of every praise. And Lord, I pray that you would bless the preaching of your word for your glory alone. I pray for every mind to be attentive, every ear to listen, and for every heart to be receptive. And I pray that we would receive the word of God as the word of God and not as a word of man. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Well, i got a great word for you today from Psalms. If you'll go ahead and open your Bible there. We're going to be looking at Psalms 122. I've chosen to give this psalm the title or this message the title, Go All the Way. And that might sound a little cliche, but I think by the time this message is over, you will find that this truly is an appropriate title for this psalm. Go All the Way, Psalms 122. Verses 1 through 9. A song of ascent of David. I was glad when they said to me, Let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem built as a city that is bound firmly together, to which the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, as was decreed for Israel, to give thanks to the name of the Lord. Their thrones for judgments were set, the thrones of the house of David. Pay for the, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they be secure who love you. Peace be within your walls and security within your towers. For my brothers and companions' sake, I will say, peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. I think that uh, today you're going to find great encouragement from this psalm. As a matter of fact, I know that many of you will. As your pastor, I know what some of you are going through. Um, I've counseled with you. I've, I've answered your phone calls or your emails. And, and I know for a shadow, without a shadow of a doubt that this message will be encouraging to very specific people but also to all of us, if we are willing to receive it. One of the most freeing moments in my life happened when I preached my first revival. I hadn't been saved very long. I was already a youth pastor in Texas at this time, starting seminary, in a small rural church in southeastern Oklahoma, where I was from, asked me if I would come preach a revival, first one I'd ever done. I can't remember specifically what I preached on, but I can remember exactly what I was studying through in my own quiet time. I was studying through the book of Romans. Now, the pastor who was there was much older than myself. So during the day, he and I would spend time together. And of course, he asked me what I was studying through, and I told him the book of Romans. And he began to just pour into me or to talk with me about specific doctrines that are taught in the book of Romans. And we, as a matter of fact, we spent a lot of time in Romans chapter 9. Now, of course, this older gentleman, this pastor, had no seminary training whatsoever. And there I was, a first-year seminary student, so automatically I assumed that I knew more than he did. And so he began to show me And to begin to talk with me concerning the truth that's taught in Romans 9. And as many of you, when you read Romans 9, you begin to argue with the text. Instead of just letting the text say what it says. So he began to show me and he began to say to me, what does the text teach? And I say, well, it says this. Well, do you believe that? And I would say, oh, you know, but... And specifically as it related to... God's sovereignty over salvation. Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. Will you say to me, why did I create you this way? Does the clay have right over the potter? And he began to ask me some very probing questions, and I began to argue with him. 
And then I began to pray and study through the book. And I realized that I needed to let God be God and let His Word be the Word. And one of the most freeing moments in my life, outside of salvation, of course, is when I came to embrace the sovereignty of God over all things. It's freeing. It actually allows you to live. And it makes sense of a lot of difficult situations. I was watching a football game yesterday, like many of you. Anybody watch the Michigan-Michigan State game? I watched it. It was a great game. Michigan State was trailing throughout the whole game. And one commentator said this. After the game was over, Michigan State ended up coming from behind and winning the game. One commentator said this. They never stopped believing. It's one thing to look at the scoreboard and to see that you're behind. But it's another thing to actually believe that you can win. Their seeing had gone all the way to believing. And so it was with me when I was preaching that revival. I saw what the scripture taught, but my seeing had to go all the way to believing. And by the way, that is the application that I have for you this morning in this passage, is that your seeing would go all the way to believing. Now, Jerusalem was a significant city in the Old Testament. Notice what he says. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. I wish people still said that. Now they say, let us stay home and watch church in our pajamas. But it wasn't so with the psalmist. The psalmist said, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem was a significant city. For example, it was the place where God chose to put his name. For example, in 2 Kings chapter 21, we read these words. In this house, in Jerusalem, I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever. It's a special place. A place where God has chosen to put his name. It's the place where Solomon built the temple. It's a place where the Ark of the Covenant settled. As a matter of fact, Solomon prayed that God would listen to the prayers of his people when they prayed towards Jerusalem. It was the place where God met his people. So when we look at this psalm, we know that this psalm is really saying something significant about the city of Jerusalem. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you that in the first part of this city, or the first part of this psalm, you're going to see tranquility. You truly will. Now, in Psalm, in in the previous psalms, for example, in Psalms 120, you remember when we studied that? In Psalms 120, the speaker was far from home. In Psalm 121, the psalmist prays for protection on his travel. Now we get to Psalms 22, or 122, and the speaker has arrived. Lord, I'm far from home. Lord, protect me on my journey. Praise God. Praise the Lord. I am here. This is truly a pilgrim song. When the pilgrim arrives in Jerusalem, he gives us a picture, if you will, of, or you might say, a virtual tour. Of the city itself. Now think about this. If you were a Jew traveling to Jerusalem and arriving at Jerusalem, the place where the temple was, where the Ark of the Covenant was kept, where God chose to dwell with His people, where sacrifices were made. Can you imagine how you would look forward to that throughout the year? And then upon arrival, how exciting that would be for you? It was a joyful experience for the people of God. The psalmist remembers being invited. He says there in verse 1, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. So David's looking back to when he was uh, invited to make the trip to Jerusalem. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. But now he's there. Our feet 
have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Now, there's something interesting in this psalm. There's debate about whether or not David is really the author. Now, why would someone debate that when the Scripture clearly says a song of ascent of David? But there is debate about whether or not David truly wrote this psalm. Why? Well, anytime you see the phrase, house of the Lord, it refers to the temple. The temple was not built during David's time. The temple was built in Solomon's day. So what's going on here? What does David mean when he makes reference to the temple? Let us go to the house of the Lord when the temple has not even been built. Surely David could not have written this. Well, I just believe if the Hebrew text says that David wrote it, then David wrote it. There's an easy solution to the problem. What's the solution? Is that David was speaking prophetically. David is looking prophetically into the future and he is thinking about Jerusalem and the temple being built and from his heart he says I was glad when they said to me let us go to the house of the Lord and looking toward that end he says our feet have been standing with you in your gates O Jerusalem David is simply looking prophetically here we see in this psalm a prophetic vision from David himself in this vision he sees two things about Jerusalem he sees first that Jerusalem is a place that's uniquely blessed it's uniquely blessed but it's also a place that is uniquely troubled we're going to use those as our two points for today Jerusalem number one Jerusalem a city uniquely blessed Notice that David paints a tranquil portrait in the first half of the psalm. Notice the tranquility. He says, I was glad to me, glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. And then he says, our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. So here they are. They've arrived in Jerusalem. They've crossed the threshold of the gate. And David says, oh my goodness. Let me give you a virtual tour of what I see. He says, the city of Jerusalem, look there at verse 3, built as a city that is bound firmly together. David says, as I see the walls of this city and how they stand erect and the strength upon which they are built, I see a city that is a picture of calm. A city that is a picture of stability and strength. A picture of, or a city of organization and order. It's a place of holy unity. He comes into the city and that's what he sees. It's strong. It's solid. It's organized. It's unified. He further speaks to this unity when he says in verse 4, to which the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord. Now, what do we know about the tribes? The tribes all stood independent of one another until they came to Jerusalem. And when they came to Jerusalem, what did the tribes do? They worshiped as one. He says, let me as I walk into the city, I see the strong pillars, the strong walls. And it's a picture of strength and stability, a picture of calmness and, and serenity. It's a picture of order and organization. It's a picture of unity. The tribes come here and they worship together. It's a place of worship, which is the primary purpose of the city anyway. What a tranquil picture. He goes on to say, he says in verse 4, To which the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, as was decreed by Israel. And what do they do? They give thanks to the name of the Lord. Notice the worship. Notice what the people are doing. They're standing as one, worshiping the Lord and giving thanks to God. When we see this tranquil picture, we can truly say, God is there. Wouldn't you agree? God is there. 
And then he says in verse 5, The thrones for judgment were set, the thrones of the house of David. Oh, it's a place of justice. The thrones are there. Righteousness is here. It's a place where the orphans and the widows are protected. What a picture of tranquility. Jerusalem, a city uniquely blessed by the Lord. But now I'd like for you to take note of the second half of the psalm. Here we are reminded that not only was Jerusalem a city uniquely blessed, it's also a city that is uniquely troubled. He says there, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Now why would he ask for such a prayer? Why would David, who's looking prophetically, say, we need to pray for the peace of Jerusalem? He looks into the future and he says, make no mistake about it, Jerusalem is a place that's uniquely blessed. Look at the tranquility. Clearly we see God. But you also need to know that Jerusalem will be a place that's uniquely troubled. Therefore, pay, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May, be, may they be secure who love you. Peace be within your walls and security within your towers. Why would the city need towers? Why would the city need strong walls? Because trouble's coming. He prays for peace. He prays for peace within the walls. He prays for security within the towers. David now looks past a time of tranquility to a time of travail. Let's talk about the city just for a moment. In 925 B.C., Shishak, king of Egypt, he takes Jerusalem during the reign of Judah's king, Rehoboam. He plunders the city in 925 B.C. In 850 B.C., the Philistines, the Arabians, Ethiopians, they laid siege during the rule of King Jer 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 Jehoram. The king's palace is sacked and the temple is plundered. This is all after David. In 792 B.C., Jehoash, king of Israel, attacks Amazah, king of Judah. Jerusalem and the temple are pillaged. Jehoash captures Amaziah and takes him captive to the northern Israel. In 735 to 732 B.C., Risen, king of Aram, and Pekah, king of Israel, they go to war against Ahaz, king of Judah. Ahaz seeks the aid of Tigath-Pileser, king of Assyria, to deliver him. In 732 Tilgath Pileser conquers Damascus and executes Rezin. In 701 BC, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, tries to lay siege to the city during the reign of King Hezekiah. He threatens to destroy it, but God has the angel of the Lord kill 185,000 troops as they prepare to enter a city of travail. In 605 BC, the prophet Daniel and his companions are taken from the city into exile into Babylon. In 597 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar again attacks the city. He captures King Jehoiachin, which he takes to Babylon. In 586 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar attacks the city for a third time. He burns the temple, destroys the city, and carry all the temple treasures to Babylon. In 320 B.C., General Nicnar of Egypt marches to Syria and takes control of the area, which includes Jerusalem. About 200 B.C., the city is besieged and taken by Antiochus the Great. In 175 B.C., the new ruler of the Hellenistic Seleucid Empire is Antiochus Epiphanes. He pillages Jerusalem, then places an altar to the pagan god Zeus within the temple. 
Antiochus IV becomes ruler of the Hellenistic Seleucid Empire. He begins to force the Greek culture into Judea. He outlaws the Sabbath and circumcision. He sacks the city. He erects an altar to Zeus and the second temple after plundering it. And then or this event is a type of Daniel prophecy. You see, it's uniquely blessed, but it's also uniquely troubled. In 164 B.C., Judas Maccabeus leads an army of Jewish descendants to victory over the Seleucids. The city is captured and the temple is rededicated. In 134 B.C., Seleucid, Seleucid king Antiochus V, Sidates, recaptures the city. According to Jewish historian Josephus, John Hacrinus opens King David's sepulcher. He removes 3,000 talents of gold to pay Antiochus in order to spare the city, assuming a modern value of somewhere around $4.9 billion taken from David's sepulcher. In 63 B.C., the Roman Republic under Pompey the Great occupies Palestine and takes Jerusalem. In 40 B.C., Antagonus, son of former Judean king Aristobulus II, joins forces with the Parthian military and storms Jerusalem. The purpose of the fight is to unset Aristobulus, uncle Hycranus II, from power. When Hycranus is eventually captured, the Parthian mutilate him in order to disqualify him from serving as a high priest. According to the historian Josephus, Judean governor Herod, upon hearing that the Parthians seek to kill him, flees to Rome to seek help. He is made king of the Jews by the Roman Senate. 37 B.C., Herod the Great, after fleeing to Rome for help after the Parthians chased him out of Judea, returns to the area within Roman soldiers in order to retake the city. He conquers Jerusalem and assumes his responsibilities as ruler. And then, 70 A.D., an important date. The Roman legions take Jerusalem by storm. They burn and level both the city and its glorious temple. You remember Jesus predicted this. Not one stone of this temple will be left upon another. Christ was speaking to the siege of Jerusalem in 7 AD. In 1099 AD, the city is captured by the army of the first crusade. They murder almost all the Jews and the Muslims. In 1917 AD, the Ottoman Empire, which had controlled Jerusalem since at least 1517, was expelled from the city through the attacks by the British under General Edmund Allenby. I could go on and on. We could talk about modern attacks against Jerusalem. My, my point was to give you a biblical account of how this city is truly a uniquely troubled city. So in this psalm, we move from tranquility to tragedy. Now I want you to pretend for a moment. Are you ready? I want to ask you to paint a picture in your mind. The title of the portrait is this, or the painting. Here's the title. In the presence of God. Now close your eyes and paint that portrait. In the presence of God. What would your painting look like? For some, perhaps, it would be a forest scene. Large trees and the sunlight penetrating through the top to shine upon, to shine upon a nice trail. A scene of serenity. Others of you, you may have painted a Picture of heaven, as best you can imagine it would be. Maybe some of you painted a church, nestled in a field somewhere, or maybe even this auditorium. But I bet no one in this auditorium drew a picture in their mind of a city under attack. Buildings burning, people dying, children crying. The sound of men screaming and women wailing. 
I would bet no one painted that picture. I would say that most of you, your picture probably has something, probably has more in common with the first half of this psalm than it does the second. For example, we, see, we clearly see God in the first half of the psalm. Wouldn't you agree? <laughs> as a matter of fact, it's quite easy to see God in such times as the one represented here. When things are going well in our life, when there's tranquility, structure and organization, unity, it's quite easy to see God. In my 21 plus years of pastoring, I have never had one person come into my office in a time of tranquility and say, where is God? Not one time. Not one time, Brother Ernie. I bet you haven't had that either. I've never had a Christian come into my office when everything's going right in their life and saying, where is God? But I tell you what I have had. I've had Christians come into my life when everything appears to be falling apart. The tranquil time is gone. The tragedy is set in. No longer do they see themselves as uniquely blessed. They see themselves as uniquely troubled. And what question do they ask of the pastor? Where is God? This proves one thing, that you and I are guilty. Guilty of what? We're guilty of determining the presence of God upon things that are good. God is there when there's tranquility. But for some reason, when tragedy hits, we begin to think God has forsaken us. Job and his friends, Job and his friends, they believed in the sovereignty of God. They did. But he looks at the world, Job does, when he looks at the world, it seems to him that this sovereign God causes moral disorder. And Job simply cannot understand what God is doing. Job said this in Job 9.11, When he passes me, I cannot see him. When he goes by, I cannot perceive him. I promise you in the time of blessing, he never said that. When his children were still sitting in the home, enjoying meals together. When he still had his riches and his livestock and his health. I promise you, he never said, he passes me. I cannot see him. When he goes by, I cannot perceive him. But that's exactly what happened when tragedy hit. We need to learn from men like Jeremiah and Nehemiah. For example, do you know what the view of Jeremiah, Jeremiah's view of Jerusalem was during the book of Lamentation? Now this is after the Babylonians have ransacked Jerusalem and they've been taken into captivity. And the prophet Jeremiah, he looks at the city, and I'm going to quote several verses throughout Lamentation. Just listen. He says this, Lonely sits the city that was full of people. She weeps bitterly in the night with tears on her cheeks. None is there to comfort her. He's talking about the city. All her majesty has departed. Her gates have sunk into the ground. In dust of the streets lie the young and the old. My eye flows with rivers of tears because of the destruction of the daughter of my people. He's talking about the city. The joy of our hearts have ceased. Dancing has been turned into mourning. What a horrible picture of tragedy and travail and devastation. That's what he sees. But that's not what he believes. Because he goes on to say this. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. You see, here's the difference. 
is that Jeremiah seeing went all the way to believing. It's easy for us to see God in the tranquil times. What I'm asking for you to do this morning is to go all the way to believing and seeing God in the times of travail. Nehemiah. The same is true of Nehemiah. Here are some verses from the book of Nehemiah. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down. Its gates are destroyed by fire. The city, the place of my father's graves, lies in ruin. And its gates have been destroyed by fire. Then I replied to them, the God of heaven will make us prosper. And we, his servants, will arise and build. His seeing went all the way to believing. All they saw was tragedy and devastation and torn down walls. But at not one time did they say, where is God in this? You see, their singing went all the way to believing. And even though they saw the tragedy, they believed in the mercy and the strength and the sovereignty of an almighty God. Who never forsakes his people. Jesus. When he came to Jerusalem, what did Jesus see when he came to Jerusalem? He saw Herod, who was nothing more than a playboy playing games. He saw that the temple had been raped and pillaged and made nothing but a den of thieves. He wept. He wept over the city. In that city, Christ was betrayed, arrested, falsely accused, tried, beaten, and ultimately murdered. What tragedy! And I ask you, where was God in the midst of Jerusalem when Christ was crucified? In the center of it all. For glory. In the center of it all. See him there upon the cross. Oh, beloved, this morning, would you allow your seeing to go all the way to believing? He's not there. He's not only there in times of tranquility. He's there in the midst of your tragedy, in the center of it all. Let us never say, where is God? Yes, we are a people uniquely blessed, but we too are a people uniquely troubled. And here's the application. God's will is for you and for me to move from merely seeing to believing. I think about what some of you are going through right now, and it's easy for you just to see. You see God in your peace. You see God in your tranquility. You see Him. It's easy to see God in tranquility, isn't it? But the same God who's in the center of it all in your times of tranquility is the same God who's in the center of it all in the times of your tragedy. He is absolutely good and sovereign over all things. See Him there. In the center of it all. Working all things out for the good of those who love God and who are called according to His purpose. How freeing is that, beloved? To grab hold of the grandeur of God is what it means to truly live. I said to you, it's freeing to embrace the grandeur of God, the sovereignty of God. Because when you do, you begin to really live. Apart from a high view of God, apart from a vision of the grandeur of God, you can't live. Would you allow your seeing to become believing today? Is this not what it means to walk by faith and not by sight? Let's talk about Navy SEALs just for a moment. I found this article interesting. Each SEAL class 
consist of a very limited number of men. Time and time again, the instructors and leaders of the class have emphasized, emphasized that each and every one of the candidates is physically fit enough to become a seal and has what it takes. So before they enter, they even have to, they have to make sure they're physically fit. Despite this fact, only about 20% of those who start the program will eventually make it all the way through. Why? If they are truly all fit, then how can so many of them, typically 80%, fall out? If they're so fit, then how do they fall out? How does this make any sense at all? The answer is stunningly simple. It boils down to their mentality. What separates those who succeed from those who don't is their state of mind. Let it rest upon you for a moment. The 80% that fail, they eventually get to a point where they say, I can't take it. Physically, they can. It's already been proven. Physically, they can. But mentally, they don't believe they can. Their seeing has not gone all the way to believing. They tell themselves, I can't do this anymore. It's impossible. And then they begin to think negatively. The one factor that is rampant among those who endure the training and actually become SEALs is their mental resilience and their unwavering belief in themselves. I would say to you, spiritually speaking, what we're talking about here is a mental state. Some of you are waiting for God to do some type of supernatural zap in your life. Zap you so that you'll start believing the right way and thinking the right way. You're just waiting on that Holy Ghost zap. Can I just tell you it's not coming? The Holy Spirit doesn't zap anybody. He has provided you with everything you need. Spiritually, you are fit. Because you are indwelt by the Spirit of God and He has gifted you. So the answer is not your spiritual fitness. It's your mentality. Some of you are right now are at the point in your life where you are saying, I can't do this anymore. It's impossible. And you begin to think negatively. And I'm asking for you to this morning to realize that you can. I'm not asking you to have an unwavering belief in yourself. <laughs> I'm asking for you to have an unwavering belief in God, who is sovereign, and who's not only there in the midst of your tranquility, He's there in the midst of your tragedy. Would you allow this morning your seeing to go all the way to believing so that you will finish well, I ask you this morning, do you know this God? Do you know Him? Would you like to know Him? Because today you can. He opens His arm and He extends salvation by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. For those of you who are in need of salvation, would you come to Him this day? Would you come to Him? Surrender your life to Him. Allow your seeing to go all the way to believing this morning. I'm speaking in salvation sense. Let your seeing go all the way to believing. Believe Him. Trust Him. Surrender to Him. And you'll be saved by Him. Here in a moment, I'm going to ask you to stand. And our pastors will be down front. I will be down front. 
And for those of you who are coming for salvation, come to us and let us pray with you. For, for, for the believer today, for the believer, my, my, the application for you is quite simple. That you would have such a high view of God and His sovereignty that you would never have to ask the question, where is God? Because one of the greatest tragedies on earth was the crucifixion of Christ. And there was God in the center of it all. And that's where He'll always be. Father, we thank You so much for Your Word today. Help us to remember that You are in the center of it all. And I pray that our seeing would go all the way to believing. Help us to give You the worship that You deserve today our great God. I pray for those in need of salvation. I pray they would come, surrender their lives to Jesus and be saved. This is your moment. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Would you stand and come as the Lord leads?